everybody. Welcome to another episode of Carolyn Talks Television. I'm Carolyn Topol, and to my far left, we have Rachel Arnett, my lovely co-host. And today, we have a very familiar face as our special guest. We have Bobby P., one of the two hosts of Two Guys and a Lot of Wine. And he's visiting our show today. <laughs> uh, I'm thank first, thanks for having me to talk about other than wine, my guilty pleasures and not so guilty pleasures, which is a lot of television shows. So I'm actually looking forward to discussing that today. And we're thrilled to have you with us in what may be the very first crossover on West Hartford <laughs> Community Television. Yes. So we like to be pioneers in TV here. <laughs> um, one of the things I'll say is our theme today is going to be breaking some viewer stereotypes who you might expect to watch certain shows and who you think the demographics are. And we three at this table know that they are wrong. Anybody can watch anything and it's all good. Uh, we're going to start by doing a little bit of chatting about one of the favorite shows of our special guest, and it happens to be one of mine. I've mentioned it before, Downton Abbey. But because we're having the person who hosts two guys and a lot of wine, <laughs> we wanted to pair it with the perfect wine. So, Bobby? Yeah, we, well, in all honesty, um, the wine actually is probably going to pair better with when we talk about The Crown. Okay. Because it's just particularly with one character, Thomas Branson. Um, this particular wine, it's called Nectar, and uh, it's, um, it's a character that was based in, on an animated character based by the art, Swiss artist Dostarny. And the reason it sort of fits Thomas Branson's character. Oh, that is Downton Abbey. Oh, I'm sorry. You're right. That is Thomas. That's Downton Abbey. That's good. The, the reason it fits Thomas Branson's character is because he was sort of the blue collar guy that was always working on the cars, always had his hands dirty. He was always brooding, like a lot of Irishmen, always brooding. <laughs> and if you look at the bottle, you'll see that this particular character has at least 15 or 16 bottles of wine in each hand. So I thought as a hands-on character, Thomas Branson will have a hands-on bottle of wine to sort of I like it. Well, I will toast to that and toast to television and your company here today. Thank you. And I should add that it's a 2012 Bordeaux. So there's a little age to it, and uh, mm. it, it's really a nice drinking red. It's the kind of thing that they would probably sit around in their parlor and, and have a little sip at. Uh, oh, yeah. And now do I sniff first or drink first? Uh, you don't have to sniff, but it's got a nice little aroma okay. to it. Very dry like most French wines. Oh, yum. And if we had taste of vision, you could share some with us too. <laughs> but trust us, this is good. So this good. is good. He knows what he's talking about. Exactly. But now let's go right into Downton Abbey, yes. um, created by Julian Fellows, who is absolutely brilliant in the art of really developing characters and sustaining them. Now he sustained them for six seasons. And this is a show that people always thought of as a, a woman's show. Maybe it was going to be soapy, but men like it too. This is not a woman's it show. It is. And I, the reason I tend to like historical pieces, especially a show like Downton Abbey, is I like structure in, in, in my TV shows. And I like uh, authenticism mm -hmm. and how a show is done when That's it comes true. to historical pieces. Absolutely. And the show is so engaging because it actually pulls you in to that time frame. And, you know, you, you know a lot about history, as I do, and just seeing how people had their places in society, how things were done, mm. and uh, so keen on detail with regards to how things looked, how, thing, how people talked, always fascinated me. And the characters themselves, um, brilliantly acted by every actor that, that portrayed them on the show. And to me, it just, it's a great show to watch from my perspective because I like order and and a purpose. Everybody has a purpose of what they're doing. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter whether we think from this modern age, well, you know, there, there was some sexism or some all these other isms that go on. That's how they lived. And I want to see how people lived at that time portrayed accurately. And I think they did a great job in doing that. I, I do believe they did. And first of all, it, talk about an A team of actors. You had uh, Hugh Bonneville, you had Elizabeth McGovern, you had Maggie Smith. I mean, it's very hard to get up there. I mean, and they had as a recurring character Shirley MacLaine. It's oh. very hard to top these incredible, incredible mm -hmm. actors, all who have gotten many accolades and awards and you name it. 
but also they really were true to the period. When you talk about a period piece, which has typically been thought of as something um, in the, if you talk about the sexism, feminine genre, this is not. This crosses everything, and they also directed a great deal of the storyline equally to the men and the women mm -hmm. of Downton Abbey, and the upstairs and the downstairs, and every avenue was covered. And I think that might be also why it is approachable, and I think people are smart and make things directed that way now. Well, I mean, even in, I'm yeah. sorry, even at a time when people yeah. had their place in society, which they certainly did in that that period of England, absolutely, is you can still be a strong character, you can be, still be portrayed as a strong woman, or a, even if you're just a servant. You all had your strengths. How you actually mm -hmm. were able to utilize them in that time frame might not be what we would find acceptable. But at that time. You know, especially going through the changes that were going on at that particular time. Correct. You know, there were a lot of people that are portrayed, I think, in a true way as to they were coming out of that subservient type culture and just beginning to get more knowledge and more uh, enlightened. And it wasn't thrown in your face. That's quite true. It wasn't thrown in your face. It was done in a way where you, you said, wow, yeah, I can see that. I mean, I love the structure and order of society, but at the same time, things change. And it was presented in a way that. You sort of want to live in a castle, you want to be Hugh Belmont, you want to have a servant, but at the same time you say, do I really want to stay dressed up all day changing my outfit? <laughs> I don't know if I'd really want no, that no. after all. And actually, so, typically yeah. they change four to six times a day, yeah. the, the upstairs folks. Um, the other piece of this is, as it is a PBS show, they are so historically accurate that they then extended this program and developed more programs, including invitations for us to see High Clare Castle, which mm. is what Downton Abbey is based on is yeah. by Claire. They truly showed you this is really how it was, and we have we are not, not changes. making this up. This, <laughs> the, is, yeah. this is exactly uh, what yes, it, yeah. and I, I did think they got a little soap opera in the last couple of seasons. Um, I thought it, they carried they carried some things way too long, like the mm -hmm. whole Bates thing, in regards to the whole criminal case about him whether he murdered that person. I thought they carried that a little bit longer than they needed to. But I, I, I actually agree with you. I was like, can we just get him yeah, out of prison and back in the cast these in the poor house people, already? They get so abused. Leave poor Bates alone. I mean, just let him his, live his life, for God's sakes. Mm -hmm. But they, sh they carry that a little longer than I thought they needed to. But all in all, in general, I think any guy, and I think there are a lot of men that have watched mm -hmm. this show just like I did, it's just a fascinating time frame to watch and enjoy. And if you love looking at old stuff like I do, that's part of the fun right there. It's like Antiques Roadshow, but with characters. That's actually fantastic. <laughs> yes. Which is one of my guilty pleasures. I love that. I'm not going to lie. I, I agree. I agree with you. That's fantastic. The people are part of the roadshow. Yes. <laughs> and now, while, while we're in England, we're going to move on to our next show, which I understand we are also both big fans of, and that is The Crown on Netflix. And uh, if you notice the purple background, sticking with our theme of royalty today, <laughs> we have our purple background, which is the royal color. Um, we move on to, like I said, The Crown, and this is created by Peter Morgan for Netflix, mm -hmm. a very, very, very accurate, in my personal opinion, view of the life of Queen Elizabeth II. It is, and I, you know, I say, when I got into The Crown, I only got into it originally because of Winston Churchill's character portrayal by John Lithgow, who yeah. I heard was fantastic, and I'm a big Winston Churchill fan. I, I, I love reading about his history and his life. So I started watching it originally because of that. And John Lithgow's performance was fantastic. I think he's one of the better portrayals of uh, Winston Churchill that I've seen. I believe he won uh, the Emmy for that. Yeah. And But just, it's, I still got drawn into it for the fact that that period in England was just such a tumultuous time. Mm -hmm. You know, going from a large empire till after World War II with the breakdown of, of a lot of their colonial holdings and how England started to change and how they still wanted their monarchy because it still mm -hmm. held them together as a country, it still fascinated me. So that, that's what really drew me in as to how that can still continue from that time frame up until modern times. But I sort of wanted to find out what it is about the monarchy that is so deep in people's hearts in England. I, I think mm -hmm. The Crown does a great show of why that's important. And I will say that I remember when I began watching it, um, I drew my husband into it because he also likes history. But he too, John Lithgow was a big selling point. He said, you know, there's got to be something here. If John Lithgow signed up for this show, mm -hmm. I I'm going to give it a chance because he knows I love royal watching. So he thought, <laughs> oh, yeah, it's one of those. But um, he is as addicted to it as I am, mm -hmm. and we wait for each new episode. And then when Netflix 
as they do drops a season, we sit and as close to time as we have, we practically binge watch The Crown when mm -hmm. it dropped. Season two, could not wait for it to be there. And we literally carved out our week around the, watching The Crown. Mm -hmm. And, and Philip and uh, Elizabeth are so superbly portrayed uh, in this show. I mean, uh, you're seeing, in my opinion, some acting at its best right now. I mean, uh, Claire, Claire Foy is incredible, as phenomenal. is uh, phenomenal. Matt Smith. And it's, it's such, so I'm a huge Doctor Who fan. And for me, that's how I knew Matt Smith, was the Doctor. Oh, you're and right. so I've seen, and I mean, he I knew was, he was familiar. Yes, one, he was one of my favorite I forgot doctors. About that, you're right, and I'm a but, Doctor but Who fan too. <laughs> but that shows you how incredible that transformation is, because sometimes you know people who portray Doctor Who like that's all they'll ever that's be known true. for. That's true. That's right. And I've only seen a few episodes of The Crown. I'll admit I haven't seen the whole show, but yeah. it's so easy to forget that he was the Doctor because he portrays this character so completely that as I'm watching, I'm not going. Where's your tur where's your fez and your bow tie? And that's not always easy for actors. Sometimes yeah. you do oh, get absolutely. cast in that way. And John to, to the point that really I think I, I feel like I'm watching Phil, Prince Philip, oh. and I feel like I'm watching Elizabeth. They truly take on characteristics we've seen. Uh, one thing I noticed, because liking little bits of trivia too, is you do see that as Elizabeth Clairefoy always has the little handbag. Mm -hmm because Elizabeth would never be seen without her handbag. Yep. And that has been true all through history ever since she became the queen. Um, the other thing is their history is so accurate. I found myself learning things I did not know particularly mm -hmm. about Philip because while I knew a great deal about Elizabeth, it's hard not to, mm -hmm. especially if you studied history. They don't get in depth as much about Philip and his history. It's almost like it take, took such a back seat, it even takes back seat in courses. Mm -hmm. You know, like you said, we discussed earlier, a lot of it has to do with his, uh, his family starting having, I don't want to say Nazi sympath sympathizers in his family, but at that particular time, members of his family were part of the German or, or Nazi party. Um, maybe not active as some other Nazis might have been, but there was a lot of bad blood between mm -hmm. his house and, uh, I believe, Elizabeth's house. And a lot of people didn't want that marriage to happen at all because of some of the history, I believe, that occurred in his past. Um, but all in all, I think uh, they've covered that to a certain degree, and I think you know that, to ex at least do some way of explaining why he is such the brooding guy he is. He always seems like everybody hates him um, in England. And I, I think part of it, that is because he went through a lot, um, being sort of stigmatized with his family's past. And it's interesting because he is portrayed um, as someone who is um, not as supportive of his wife as you would like him to be. Mm -hmm. But I would imagine that's more reality than we would like to think also uh, because he is a human being. And he really had no place. I mean, his wife had the power and he was, he really didn't have an authoritative place in and, the- And she truly made her decisions based on the responsibility Mm -hmm. to her country. Correct, yeah. And which left him in the dust more than once. Sure, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, however, yet they do remain together and they always knew this was going to be a lifelong commitment. Yep. And punchline, they're still married today. They so are, that's yeah. fascinating, absolutely fascinating. Um, and both in their 90s, which, you know, goodness gracious, God bless them both, because <laughs> they're still going out. I mean, the fact that Philip retired from public meetings just this year. Yep. I find that incredibly admirable. I hope in 90 I can say I'm ready to retire. Yeah. And, and for me especially, you know, I think shows like this are good for everybody because a lot of people don't, I think, get engaged with history as much as they should mm -hmm. and learn about not just America's past, but Europe's past and other people's history because it just, it gives you a better perspective onto events and things that are going on. So. And one of the things that's the best about this show also for all people, which is why I think I love the fact that it's in the U.S., mm -hmm. is that it layers in what's happening around the world, including in the U.S. For example, season two incorporated a visit from the Kennedys, which mm -hmm. did happen. Wasn't the best Kennedy portrayal person I've seen portray Kennedy, but they still got the mannerisms down. I thought that was maybe their weakest casting for the character of Kennedy. Mm -hmm. But his, his presentation of 
the Kennedy character I thought was well done. He just didn't look like Kennedy. No, he did not look like Kennedy, but I think they incorporated what was needed, especially historically, to, yes. to demonstrate the impact the Kennedys had on Elizabeth and mm -hmm. Philip, both. Mm -hmm. both. Um, and what I'd love to do now is move on, because we're going to stay one more time <laughs> in this theme of really unusual, because I, I was so surprised when you shared with me a few weeks ago that you also enjoy Victoria. I do. And you've watched Victoria on PBS. And I think you and I have those similar opinions about Victoria compared to the first two shows we talked mm -hmm. about. So I'll let you go first. Share a little bit about Victoria, whose creator, by the way, is, is Daisy Goodwin. Once again, it's another one of the shows that I tend to always be drawn to once I see it's coming on television or on a, a cable channel. is because it's a historical show. So I always want to watch it and see where they're going with it. Is it going to be silly? Is it going to be mm -hmm. uh, you know, not based in factual or history? And you, know, I, I, you probably know more about history than I do when it comes to Victoria Erie, but I wanted to watch it for that particular reason. And I was, and Victoria and her husband had a profound love for each other that's, that's well known, and I wanted to see why, what, what caused that. Are they gonna show the, what caused that relationship to be so strong and pretty much shape her for the rest of her, her life? Mm -hmm. And uh, that's what drew me in originally. Yes. And I still think the show is very, it was well done. I think it's lighter than The Crown. It's not as serious. You're going to feel, some, sometimes you watch The Crown, you feel, well, that, that's a tough life to be the queen or, or mm -hmm. Prince Philip. This one, you, you sort of see two people's love and you see how that affects them and the people around them. So it's, it's a little lighter. I don't want to say it's soap opery, but it's lighter and it's a little easier to watch without feeling so, like sometimes if you watch The Crown, you might not be able to fall asleep right afterwards because you're thinking about, wow, that, that's pretty profound or that's very interesting how that happened. When, when I watch, uh, for example, The Crown, at the end of the episode, typically their arc ends what I would call a hook for the next one. Mm -hmm. And especially when they're in the middle of dropping them and they want you to keep watching one after another. And I sit there and say, oh, you know, you have that gas <laughs> moment. I cannot believe that happened. Mm -hmm. or they'd made that decision, or is that how it's going to go politically? And really, we all have the history books. We know what way it goes. But I'm so engaged yeah. in the show, which shows its quality, that I'm sitting here yeah. as if I don't know what's going to happen next. Absolutely. You know, that's what's great about a well-done Absolutely. show. It's so well done, and even though you know it's in the history book, you for a moment think, something's going to change. History will change right history in front of me. Yeah. Right, right. And the history book is wrong. And the history book, <laughs> right. And with Victoria, we all know the story, like you said. We know this woman had an incredible love for her husband who died halfway through her life. Um, so profoundly in love with Prince Albert and also married, by the way, a, a prince that people didn't want. That's true. German prince, they did not want this German no, prince they did not. In, in, in England, but she's, she, this was her choice. This was her choice. She was, a, she was a little princess with a little bit of moxie and then when she became queen, she let that moxie grow. Um, and, and also demonstrated her capabilities at the same time, both and politically also, and ethically. Also played, by the way, by another Doctor Who alum, Jenna Coleman, who That's was true. Clara. That's true. That's true. You remember your Doctor Who characters better than yeah. me. I, I've not as, I, I, was, I watched Doctor Who for a long time up till about the late 80s, and then I took a oh. break. I didn't come back to the early 2000s, so, okay, so I'm still catching like up. David Tennant. Yes, yeah. yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But I have to tell you, I've seen Jenna Coleman in that, yeah. and I... Just when you said it now, I said, oh, that's right. There's something about these British actors that They're are good. able to just fill these characters so completely that by the time they move on to a new show, you've almost forgotten the other characters that they've played because they're yeah. so good in that role. And in Victoria, as you said, the writing arc is significantly different. Each show, which is airs on PBS on Sunday nights, um, takes a controversial piece of history. Mm -hmm and takes us through what happens, what the issues are, how Victoria handles it, how Albert might handle it, how everybody handles it. And then the end ends up tied up in a ribbon. Mm. But it's not a fake ribbon, that's what happened. And so they choose the, the two, moments where something resolved to end the show on a correct, more positive they, note. They end, it's resolved, and you know that once again, Victoria and Albert are on the same side. Which sometimes I like. I like yeah. that aspect of watching a show. Um, where I know, in general, it's going to end with some conclusion, and uh, oh, yeah. generally Rather some... than dragging something on for... And I can move on the Absolutely. next day. I mean, I was sharing earlier 
that for me, because it's on Sunday night, I DVR it, and the way to start a Monday morning, when it's a Monday morning, <laughs> is to watch Victoria, because I feel good after I've watched that show. <laughs> yes. Absolutely. It, I enjoy it, it makes me feel good, and it sets me up for a good week ahead, so that I can go to work and not think it's Monday. It's Monday. <laughs> It's Victoria Day. It's Victoria Day. <laughs> and now, moving on, while we were talking about breaking some stereotypes here with some of what you watched, then we're going to change a little to another interesting uh, selection that you enjoy <laughs> that my co-host has endorsed more than once and keeps oh. nudging me in the direction of the MTV Challenge. So go ahead, Rachel. I really wish that everyone would watch the challenge because it is, I mean, to be honest, it's trash TV. Of course. But it's athletic, dramatic, trash TV, and it's such this beautiful microcosm where you can tell how manipulated they are by producers. And just for the record, trash TV does not go with this wine. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is not. So they do TV. sometimes drink a lot of wine yeah. on the challenge. <laughs> Oh, uh, yes. <laughs> That's something they've added recently is now they're filming at the bars now, too, which they yeah. didn't always do. I, I, like I said, it just, to me, I, I got into watching because it's just sort of, I hate to say this, it brings you back to college. Oh, yeah. And, you know, as you get older, oh, you yeah. say, wow, I wish I could watch something on TV that sort of reminded me of my college years. And, <laughs> and the challenge, even though it's an exaggeration <laughs> yeah. of oh, that, absolutely. it's just these people, they never, they're, they, they're aging, but at the same time, they're not aging. They're just partying and doing the show. That's all they do. Yeah. There are a couple people like Johnny Bananas, Cara Maria, that this is literally what they do. Like, this is their career. And they may have little side projects, like Johnny Bananas raises money for the Special Olympics, and he does um, speaking tours. But this is really his bread and butter. This is what his career is, his MTV personality. And you love watching challenges as a group. You love watching people oh, yeah. do these crazy challenges that you just say to yourself, why are they doing this? I mean, why? So is every episode a different challenge then? or And they most, eliminate people. Yeah, for the most yeah. part. Sometimes they kind of do a little bit of TV enjambment where they'll finish a challenge at the very beginning of the next episode to grab you. Like they'll do the dramatic music to the black screen. And you got to wait till the following yeah. week to see who gets eliminated. But yeah. the challenges themselves, because they're so outrageously ridiculous, Okay. That you just watch every every season because you want to first see how they're going to do the challenges. Mm -hmm. Second of all, you want to see if some of the recurring characters are going to be back because you have to say to yourself, don't they get married? Don't they have other jobs? And I guess and, they don't. And, well, some <laughs> of the it, it's funny because some char characters are, and it's funny to call them characters because they are people, they are characters. <laughs> but but they they are they've really like my my friend who watches with me and actually participates in a fantasy league for the challenge, to the like a baseball fantasy league for the challenge. Has, we okay. were just talking about the character arc of so, one like, of the main characters. So do you have like characters. posters in the background where you're crossing people off? Oh, she off. does, not me. I, I'm, I'm not that dedicated. And I think that the actual first challenge started in 2000. So the show's yeah, been going. It, it was just a real world Road Rules challenge. Um, it was actually part of a Road Rules episode where they brought them in and did a few small challenges and then the ratings spiked. And now it's just a known thing that if you're on the real world and you have a controversial personality, you'll probably get pulled onto the challenge or and invited. I, and I want to say really quick, I, I, I do like TG Levin. I think uh, oh, since yeah, his accident, I know he's yeah. slowed down a little bit. He had a pretty severe accident because yeah. he was a professional, I think, bike rider. Yep, BMX. Um, but he's a good host. I think he adds a lot to the show, too. He's, he's subtle, but he, he can dig at him when he needs yeah. to. So it, it's, it's a really guilty pleasure. Even my wife watches it. And, um, it's just. <laughs> I, I love how you said even. Yeah. <laughs> well, I never. I didn't know about the challenge until about nine years ago because my wife's sister is a teacher and she watches it religiously. Oh, and yeah. She told us about it and I said, MTV. Who the hell watches MTV? Oh, who watches MTV anymore? <laughs> it's and okay. I, that's I that's turned an acceptable it on. word these days. <laughs> I turned it on and I was hooked the first episode and that was oh, back yeah. when Beth was on. You know, remember oh, Beth? Oh gosh, yes. So uh, that's that's sort of what did it for me. The challenge yeah. and characters. And the other thing that because you see these people. Really now, some of the people we've seen 10, 15 seasons in a row, you start to develop, not bonds, because they're not, you know, but you start to really care about them. And you do, yes. Unfortunately, cast members have passed away um, from cancer or from other circumstances, and it really affects people. Mm -hmm. And there's been a huge amount, specifically, of attention paid to cancer, um, because one of the most popular contestants survived multiple bouts of cancer and then got sick on her final show and ended up going home and passing away soon after. Yeah, that was a tough one. Wow. And you can see those moments remind you that these are not just characters, that they are people. And as much as they've signed up to be on television and produced, that at the end of the day, we don't really 
know them and know their whole story and we it kind of I think adds the humanity back into what can be a pretty inhumane spectacle. So it's almost like a, a cross between reality TV and just fun uh, raucous enjoyment. It's like real world plus uh, American gladiators <laughs> plus um, yeah, it's like if you had a camera yeah. and you can go back to your college days when you went out to, say, the Caribbean or the Bahamas with your friends, mm -hmm. and somebody was filming you for that whole week you were there. And then they made you eat cow brains while yeah, standing it, on top of a peeler while they hit you with pillows. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's just like completely <laughs> you know. outrageous, but... Yeah. Very guilty. I'll, I'll just say I'm glad they didn't have you know little video cameras in the telephones when I was in college. In fact, we didn't have little telephones in our purses that's when true. I was there in were, college. I, I, that's true. Yeah, no. No, that the is... telephone was in the house and it had a little rotary thing going on. I don't know what that yeah. is. No, just kidding. I <laughs> <laughs> okay, when your when your co-host tells you that she's so far younger than you, I know what a rotary phone is. <laughs> um, just to wrap it up. While, while Bob does watch a lot of variety of television, and I'm glad you do because it tells us TV is not genre specific anymore. It really is very global for all viewers. And there's a lot to choose from now because there's so many channels and so many opportunities to watch different types of shows. Absolutely. But I know also one of your favorite shows you said was The Expanse on the side yeah, and Network. I, I, and I just wanted to give you a moment to share that. Really, with us. if you're a Battlestar Galactica fan, and Battlestar Galactica was fantastic. And for I love that reasons. show, by the way. Yeah. Uh, drama, the human condition. But yeah. Battlestar Galactica was so dark because you only had so many survivors left of humanity. And they were battling, well, obviously. And everyone's dying. Everybody's dying. It's very depressing, <laughs> but well done. The Expanse is an epic sci-fi drama. I think it's going into its third season with Thomas Jane. Um, Mars is a developed planet. Earth is a developed planet, but they need a lot of their resources from the, the asteroid belt and from Mars. So you have this whole dynamic of Earth working with Mars, but Mars is its own, its own world now. So mm. you have two different governments competing for resources, which are all coming from the asteroid this belt. asteroid belt, yes. But there's also a dark mystery, an alien presence, which might change humanity. And, uh, you got me. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it is <laughs> engaging, it's fantastic, it's well done, produced, and just really two thumbs up on The Expanse. Wow. And so just to tie it all up, you know, we know that we enjoy history, seems to be a thread through this. Mm -hmm. History that's behind us, modern history, and somewhat futuristic what may be in the future because I'm personally not one to ever think this is all it could ever be. <laughs> I never know. Maybe there will be life living on those other planets. So I say we've covered the History Channel, PBS, Sci-Fi, and Netflix. Yeah. And that's all in just one 28-minute segment. Yeah, about I know. We never got to the Vikings, which is another great historical piece, too. That's maybe for another show. Oh, hey. We got plenty more, and you are always welcome back <laughs> with or without the wine to go with the show. Yeah, I think the Vikings drank wine. What do they drink? So thank you for <laughs> joining us for another episode of Carolyn Talks Television, and we'll see you next month. Bye-bye.